As we continue through the day, there will be a couple of changes um, in the programming, and one of them is that Dr. Salafu will be the first person to present today. Um, and I'd like to invite Dr. Salafu to the stage. You all know him, but his bio is on the back of the program. Let's do the Brooklyn way. Good morning, everyone. OK, that's very good. Um, first of all, welcome. Uh, to all of you for coming for this symposium. Uh, as the President said and Pam said, this is our first uh, transport, and now you know the meaning of transport, so we're going to be using the acronym throughout transport, transport, transport. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, my job here today is to get you to understand what the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center is and how it connects with the uh, transport program. Obviously, the President has done a very good job of explaining what transport is, so I'm not going to to those details, but I'll tell you what uh, that uh, integration with uh, BHDC is. <clears throat> Can I have my slides? Before I go, though, I'd like to acknowledge a number of people in the audience uh, who are really very important to our research. Um, Larry, could you get up and be recognized from UAlbany? That's my counterpart at UAlbany. <clears throat> and then uh, James Diaz is uh, Vice President for Research from Louis Alban and our former dean, who is now the PI, the contact PI for transport. Where is Carla? Carla is the, all right, Carla, everybody knows Carla. So it's... I just want to acknowledge publicly that the, the name transport, the acronym was, uh, you know, the thought for the transport acronym was Carla's idea. So thank you very much for that. Okay. <clears throat> So what is BHDC? Every community in the United States needs some form of um, community engagement, especially from the academic perspective. So sometime in 2002, the Brooklyn Borough President commissioned uh, a group uh, called the Milano Group. They did a very nice review of the challenges in Brooklyn, how to provide care to the underserved population in Brooklyn. And they came up with a report. That report was named the Milano Report. And the Milano report recommended that the Brooklyn Borough President meet with an academic medical center and a community-based organization to put together a team that would look into the issues of Brooklyn's health, particularly a group that is going to be the think tank of Brooklyn, study the issues, provide recommendations for policy recommendations. And that was the beginning of the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. So sometime in 2004, the Borough President of Brooklyn then met with our president, uh, Rosa, and uh, they pulled Atta Ash <clears throat> into the equation, and then they formed what is now known as the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. So the role of BHDC, Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, is to organize the research that is community-based, that is within the community, and that is generated by the community, to be able to help the people who are suffering from a whole lot of health disparities issues. Uh, in Brooklyn and across uh, New York City. So that's how it was formed. And since then, uh, we've had leadership changes. Our first leader was uh, Dr. Clark. He had left the institution, and then uh, we had Dr. Brown, who was there briefly. Dr. Brown is a nephrologist in this institution. Uh, then he was there for <coughs> briefly, and then I became the uh, director in 2010. So these are the area, these are the, this is SUNY Downstate, and then the other Ash Institute, and then the Brooklyn Borough President. So the rationale for this structure was to make sure that academic medicine has a voice in the community. That was the rationale for the structure. And you cannot have a voice in the community unless you are working with somebody who really knows the community. And that was the rationale for the other Ash Institute. So, so although it's more expansive, now we've expanded to more than 45 community-based organizations, but that is the core. The core is to make sure that there is an academic, community, uh, and government partnership to address health disparities issues all over the country, uh, particularly in Brooklyn. So these are our current leaders, but myself, and we have Marilyn from the uh, Atta Ash Institute, and then Sandra from the Brooklyn Borough President's Office. So that is the current structure now. Now, this structure doesn't change much uh, because we want stable leadership. Uh, this is the agreement on paper for the organization to be formed. So whenever somebody uh, you know, goes off from the SUNY side, somebody replaces. Whenever somebody goes off from the community side, somebody replaces. 
and somebody from the Bureau President's office, you know, is not in that same position, the position changes and then they replace somebody. So that is the structure right now dealing with the issues uh, uh, in Brooklyn. Our staff members, you know them already, so I'm going to skip this one. And we have a program advisory committee. There is no way to do this kind of work without having to be advised by an external advisory committee. It's mandatory, it's required, so we have one. And we have very good uh, people all across the world. They understand health disparities issues, and they contribute a lot to our writings. So we have uh, Dr. Andrewley, we have uh, Dr. Isling, uh, Francesca Gainey. All these people are heavily funded from the NIH. Uh, she's at uh, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and he's in Texas. We have in our audience uh, Dr. Shell. He's the director for the Center for Elimination of Minority Health Disparities at UAlbany. He's been very, very helpful to us in terms of trying to get uh, this particular uh, transport program funded. As a matter of fact, when we considered applying for the application, I spoke to Dr. Patu, and then I said, well, look, we have to have somebody from UAlbany participate in this. And he said, do you know somebody? I said, of course I know somebody. I know Dr. Uh, Shell. Let me give him a call. And when I spoke to Larry, I didn't realize that they also had exact same transport, I mean, uh, S21 funded from the NIH to do exact same thing, an endowment award of $10 million. So when he said, oh, we've already been funded for that, so wow, congratulations. So would you be able to, would you like to be part of our, you know, program advisory committee? He said, yes. I said, okay, thank you very much. And he wrote us a beautiful letter, and thank you, and actually reviewed our write-ups, and uh, that helped us to get this grant. So thank you very much. And then we have, you know, our, uh, Dr. Chow, Tin uh, Sherwin from, from, uh, from NYU, uh, Monica Sweeney, uh, who is the uh, chair of the, um, the Department of Health Policy in the School of Public Health at Downstate. Um, so those are our program advisory committee members. So these are standing members. Whenever somebody is out, we replace somebody. And whenever we are writing a grant, we let them know what we're doing. And we, they actually review. For those of them who are available, they actually review our work to make sure that provide input that is important uh, for the application to be successful. So we've been very busy. Um, this is, it's amazing when you are doing academic work, we tend to focus so much on the successes, which is good, but for every one success there are like 10 failures. So what, we are, what I'm telling you in this slide is what we have been successful in doing. The number of failures is unbelievable. If you're going to be distracted because you failed, you will never make it. If you really are going to be distracted because you failed, you are never going to make it. Last year, for instance, we did 13 submissions, 13 NIH submissions. And we got one. But the one is $10 million. That's how you have to think about it. Uh, and we have to keep revising, talking to the right people, and trying to figure out what did I do wrong, what, how, what can I do better next time? That is the approach that everybody has to have. Not that I tried and I didn't feel nobody likes me. Nobody hates you either. Nobody even knows you exist. We don't even know you exist. So there's no reason for anybody to hate you or don't, doesn't like your application. This is peer review. You have to respect what your peers say. If you're not willing to accept what peers say, you cannot make it in this environment, academic. So the advice is that when you write something that is not funded, when you write a paper that is not published, Nobody is against you. Those are your peers, period. You have to say, what do you think? How can I be better? How can I write this? Who should I talk to to improve what I'm doing? That should be the natural position for all of us if we're going to succeed. So this is just to tell you where we are right now. And this is good because uh, we have $24 million that uh, has come to the center since we started. And that's really very good. So we are going to be focusing now on increasing partnerships, which is obvious. Disseminating information, which we have been doing very well. Uh, Palm and Lucky are really amazing. We have contacts. Our mailing list is thousands and thousands of people. Any information we get, we just shoot out to the Brooklyn residents, and uh, people respond. We have an open portal where people can actually ask questions to BHDC, and we actually respond to those questions. Um, we have a large network of CBOs, like I said. We have more than 45 that actually participate. They come, we meet with them every three months. It's a huge undertaking. But they love to come to downstate. They want to know what is going on. And so we keep them engaged. And uh, by that engagement, we get to know what they think. And part of the, um, the, the requirement 
for a successful application in health disparities is actually to engage the community. If you don't engage the community very well, you're unlikely to be successful. So there are two terminologies which you might hear today or in your readings. One of them is community-based participatory research, which means that you actually go to the community and you ask them, what is your problem? They will tell you your problem and you design research around it. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to go door to door knocking and say, what's your problem? There is a process to getting that done. That process is called Delphi. In other words, you probe the community by surveys, they tell you broad things, then you narrow it, then you narrow it, then you narrow it until you get to what the community is really focusing on. And that is community-based participatory research. That is the ideal. The other one is community-engaged research, which means that you're engaging the community, but you're not really taking the ideas, which is, for instance, we know that maternal mortality is a problem in Brooklyn, or maternal mo morbidity is a problem in Brooklyn. So we will go to the community and we'll say, okay, we know you have the problem, and we want to solve it, and we have a solution. Just help us to solve it. So you are engaging the community in the solution. That is community engagement. So that is less ideal in terms of research and being able to understand what the community needs. Uh, but either way, if you put up a very good application and you uh, address the issues of the community in a way that makes sense, you could still be funded and you can find the answers uh, that would then come back and help the community. So the transport team is here. You all, you know all of them. Uh, the last people I'm going to mention by name because they may not be here and uh, they did a lot of work in helping us. Mark Stewart is the Dean for the School of Graduate Studies. Mohamed Bushdier was mentioned. Michelle Patu is in the audience. Michelle, you want to raise your hand and stand up? Okay, that's Michelle. Michelle is the Director of the Institute for Genomic Health. Uh, she's a psychiatrist and geneticist, right? Genetic psychiatrist. Uh, she likes the genes. Um, Tracy Wilson might come in sometime today, Amy Efable uh, might come in today, and Michael Joseph, uh, these are all from the School of Public Health. Uh, so we have the School of Graduate Studies, um, that is Mark Stewart, the School of Public Health, the College of Medicine. Um, I saw Shirley here this morning, uh, Shirley Girard, from the, um, from the School of Nursing. So, so we are trying to be as comprehensive as possible from the transport perspective. In other words, Transport is not designed for any particular school. It's designed for the entire campus. And so anyone who has an idea or who wants to participate in the programs is welcome to do so. And um, we'll be happy to collaborate with that person. And we want to also acknowledge Betty Smith from the Dean's Office who worked with Dr. Patu really, really very well to get this done. And when the grant came in, all the paperwork uh, that was needed uh, in collaboration with Palm and like here was able to do all that stuff for us. And, and John, who was very instrumental in putting the uh, actual application uh, last minute pieces together. Okay, so the objectives are what? We wanted to create this program because there's a need. The president has already made those remarks and uh, I don't wanna belay those points again. Uh, he made a very good remark on that. The video was very explicit, but there's a real, real shortage if you, there's actually published literature that shows that if you want to solve the issue of health disparities, you have to have enough people engaged in that conversation. That's number one. And you have to have enough minority people also engaged in that conversation, the research itself. That is well documented, right? So if we don't have enough people of minority extraction uh, underrepresented minorities who can be trained to be part of the conversation, it's really, really very difficult to get to the solutions. That is the goal, in summary, of transport. We want to increase that capacity to be able to do that. So this is the organization. Um, so um, you see that uh, we will be recruiting postdoctoral candidates or junior faculty members. They will undergo uh, a summer training program in year one. And these are the areas we're going to be focusing on, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, HIV, mental health. All these areas are what we call the content expert areas, the content expert areas. So there are going to be mentors in these areas that these trainees are going to be connected to. In year one, they will receive basic training. And then in year two, the expectation is that they will come back to the program well prepared uh, they would have written, worked with their mentor and written a 
grant, which is NIH style, that's actually reasonably prepared and could be submitted. That's what we expect in year two. It doesn't have to be submitted, but it could be submitted. So the, it has to be developed to that level by the time you get to summer two, right? And then that's the end of the, uh, the two-year period. And then hopefully we can recruit those people who do very well into the faculty. And we expect publications and grant applications and that we can keep some of those people into the system. Or those people will be qualified to join other systems where they can, they can do health disparities research. So that is the structure. Now the theme, you can see the theme here. The theme, whether you're doing cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, HIV, or mental health, we wanted the themes in these areas to actually focus on health disparities, genomic health, because all these areas have a component of genomic disparities. And they probably have the social determinants as well, of course. You know that housing, income, that kind of stuff. We know that this is pervasive. It's always there. The one that we haven't been doing much is the genomic health. What are the differences, the biologic differences that uh, creates these disparities? And so we want to make sure there's a theme across the various content areas. So this one um, tells you the undergraduate programs that we will be creating. Um, we would have a program called Sprint. This will attract undergraduate students uh, every summer. They would be recruited to, I mean the goal is to get these people to be interested in downstate programs and hopefully they would end up in downstate programs. And then hopefully they will end up uh, in, into um, uh, our research programs and hopefully they will end up with publications, grant applications and of course retention of faculty. But the goal here really is to trigger this interest in health uh, careers in uh, the undergraduate uh, um, campuses. So for instance, Mega Evers, we have a relationship with Mega Evers and Brooklyn College. Um, if we could trigger a lot of these underrepresented minorities to be interested in their careers, they can connect with us and hopefully we can get them to our graduate programs and hopefully they can be junior faculty members and the like. And then one day they'll be here giving the talk. That is the goal. Okay. And then for the, um, the, there are other opportunities to get junior faculty members from our own schools and, and, and training programs. And uh, we are working very hard to get them recruited into transport. And the goal is to go through the same thing as in figure one for those junior faculty members who want to join transport uh, for the two-year program. And uh, hopefully they will end up with publications, grant applications, and then we can retain them in the faculty. So, the, my last slide talks about the impact. We would provide a rigorous research training infrastructure that will produce the mass that is needed to make uh, this whole health disparities research more meaningful. Now, why are we always talking about research, research, research? It looks like you're a researcher, but that's not the point. You have to understand the issues. That's where we're getting to. We can say, you know, anything we want to say but we cannot make it into policy unless you have some backup. You have to have a rationale for creating policy. So all this research we're doing is going to end up in somebody's desk, let's say the president's desk, and then he will sign something. That's what it means. You have to have the evidence behind the interventions that will decrease health disparities. That's why we're so focused on the research piece of it. Of course, the dissemination is very good, the campaigns are very good, the outreach is all very good to stimulate people, but until we get the real answers to the very, very important biologic or social questions, it's really very hard for policy to be effectuated. And until policy is effectuated, either at the local level or at the national level, it's really very hard to influence uh, health disparities on a larger scale. So that is the reason why we're focused on the research piece of it. So that is the uh, end of my uh, presentation. Um, thank you very much again for coming, and I'm looking forward to a very, very productive discussion this morning and the afternoon.